Hi friends, welcome to the Connected Families podcast. I'm Stacey Bellward, your host. Our main aim for this podcast is to guide you towards God's grace and truth for you so that you can pass God's grace and truth on to your children. Well, thanks for being with us today. Today's podcast is on adoption because November is adoption month. And many of us here at Connected Families, our staff, and many of you in our community have adopted. But listen, if you haven't adopted, don't go away. (laughs) Today's episode is for you. If you have realized that so much parenting advice is not really a good fit for your family because of your unique struggles. I remember thinking that. And the two guests that I have with me today also came to a point in their parenting where they realized they needed some new thinking because the old way was not necessarily working. Well, my guests today are, first of all, Anna Brosh. Anna Brosh is the executive director at Connected Families, but really she is my super good friend. Her and I adopted our kids around the same time. Back in 2004, 2005, our kids were born in Ethiopia. We We worked together on lots of things around adoption in Ethiopia. And so welcome, Anna. Hi, it's so good to be here. I'm so glad for you to be at the microphone with me here for Connected Families. It's so awesome. But would you just introduce your family for everyone? Sure. I have been married to my husband, Grant, for almost 25 years. Uh, We have two kids, both through adoption. Our son is... 16. He joined our family at four months. I know. (laughs) License driving around. Mm. Our son is 16. And again, join our family through adoption at four months. Our daughter is 15 and joined our family through adoption at nine months. We also have a golden doodle. His name is Fozzie and he's pretty fantastic. And I just closed him in another room so he doesn't bark during this podcast. (laughs) That's awesome. That's great. Well, my other guest that I have with me is Jen Berkey. Jen, you came to Connected Families after four biological kids. You are in the process of adopting here at Connected Families. You are the content and social media manager. So anything you see, she makes sure all of our grammar is great. (laughs) And we love you for that, Jen. So you have a, a newer journey actually towards adoption. Tell us about your family. We do. I've been married to my husband for over 20 years as well. And we've had connections to Haiti for a long time. And then we got to a point after having four biological children that we were felt moved to adopt more from Haiti. And so we currently have a son who's in college. Our kids range in ages from 11 to 20. Well, 20, he's almost 21. We have one in college and five that live at home. Our youngest two daughters joined our family through adoption um, at the ages of seven and nine. So they were quite a bit older than your and Anna's kiddos. And our girls have been working for four years really hard to learn what it means to be in a family and bond with our family. Yeah, so good. I'm so just grateful to be on a team at Connected Families with you too and be part of the adoption world together. I don't know if I've ever told everyone our story, but my husband is Scottish. We've been married for 21 years this year too. And our oldest we adopted, she was born in Ethiopia and she came home when she was six months old. And then we had Kaylee biologically. So we have yeah, two daughters and they also are junior and senior. I think everyone knows that because I tell stories about high school and, (laughs) but that's our family. So I feel like, you know, as we were planning this podcast and the three of us sat down, I got a little emotional. (laughs) This Mm -hmm. is kind of a deep topic, isn't it? Jen and Anna that we're, that we're talking about here. And I mean, I know Anna, you know, we've walked through this adoption journey for like 16, 17 years now. Right. And we know hundreds of families and we really have seen the heights of beauty in adoption and also the ashes that are around it too. And there's so much heartache and there's, there's so much joy and the daily struggle can be so real. It, it's complex. It's complex. And so we here, Anna, Jen, and I, we feel so grateful for Connected Families. 
for having found connected families. So grateful for the framework. And so we're going to dive into that today, but I just want to tell you, here's what we're going to do in this episode. First of all, we, we want to explain from an adopted parent's point of view, why we do some of the things we do, the things that are maybe puzzling to those of, you know, other people who haven't adopted. The second thing I want to do is I want to talk about trauma for a quick minute and why all adoptive families um, know that we are dealing with trauma. And then the third, and for most of the time today, I really want to talk about how the framework has really influenced our family, our parenting, how it brought a new perspective that we really needed as adoptive families. So does that sound good, Jen and It Anna? does. And you had said it feels emotional. And I think the reason it feels emotional to talk about this is because it is vulnerable. And yes. I'm always very careful about what I share about my family with others, even in one-on-one -on -one conversation or in a recording like this, because it is vulnerable. And so we are protective of our kids and that'll come out in the conversation as well. Yeah, for sure. Here's the first thing that I want to talk about. Let's explain why we as adoptive parents feel uncomfortable calling our kids our adopted kids. <laughs> now, I think I maybe <laughs> referred to that in the past <laughs> in my introduction. And sometimes I do that when I'm talking about biological versus adopted. Um, but Anna, can you explain that adopted kids phrase and why that feels uncomfortable sometimes? Yeah, sure. Words matter. As we know, words are so important. And if you say adopted kid, this is my adopted child, then it is labeling them. It is their identity. And they joined our family through adoption. So they're, they're children first and adoption comes second. Just like, for instance, if you are raising a child with a disability, you wouldn't say disabled child. You would say, this is my child with a disability. Yeah, that's yep. good. That's good. I remember when we just brought our oldest home and we were, at, we were at a garage sale for some funny reason. Well, I was with my mom. She loves them. And I remember her explaining to the lady, you know, oh, you know, she, my daughter adopted her baby. And, and it was, and I remember getting in the car and saying to my mom, mom, you know, I don't need to explain my daughter. Mm -hmm everywhere we go. I don't owe people, you know, the story of why I have my daughter, who's obviously not my birth daughter, because she's black and I'm white. And I remember just like her puzzling about that, like, wow, like, yeah, you're right. And so that's really good. Here's another one, another phrase that we bristle at. Maybe Jen, you can take this one. The phrase gave up her baby. I still hear this sometimes, like on the news and different places. Why do we bristle at that? I don't know. I mean, that one is that one and put up for adoption are two phrases that I just really don't like. G gave up makes it sound like mom gave up on parenting. I mean, that's kind of the way that I look at it. Like she gave up when we all know that these moms showed unbelievable amounts of courage in what they did and things that we hear in this country, a lot of us can't even imagine what it would take to, to realize that your baby needed something that you couldn't provide in that moment. Put up for adoption. I don't know how many people know this, but if you Google it and you want to learn more, back in the day, there used to be trains of kids that would move across the United States full of kids that had either been separated from their parents for some reason, or their parents had died or whatever had happened. And they literally would stand them on a block at the train station, put them up on a block and people would you know, say whether they would adopt them or not. That's where put up for adoption oh, wow. comes from. Jen, I didn't know that. There's a book called Orphan Train. If you haven't yeah. read it, it's a, it's a historical fiction book, but it is 90% of it is true. And it is yeah. an amazing book. I can't think of the author right off the bat, but it's called Orphan Train. And yeah. it's really, you learn a lot about where adoption has, has gone in our country. Yeah. So we don't like gave the baby up or put up mm -hmm. for adoption because it just is such a, it feels flippant. Mm -hmm. It does and, feel flippant. Yes. And I, I feel like the phrase made an adoption plan is honoring both to the, to the first mother and to the child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. Yep. Well, another one that makes me bristle is, do you have any children of your own? <laughs> I have gotten that one. And I'll tell you that one really has made me bristle. And the yeah. reason is because, you know, when we, when people come to us and ask us some of these things or have these comments, I hear them through the ears of my children. 
So if my daughter was standing there and she was at one time, I just can't even imagine how she would understand that question. Do you have any children of your own? (laughs) So you hear me, right? Girls like, yeah, I do. She's right here. She's a hundred percent. My own is the answer that I give. Similar Um, question that I hear is, uh are your children real brother and sister? Right. Because they're both born in Ethiopia. Right. So So people are curious and they just ask the question. What they're asking is, are they biologically related? Mm -hmm. So my answer is, yeah, they're absolutely (laughs) real brother and sister. And I, then I say, do you mean, are they biologically related? And, and so it's an afterthought and then people understand, oh, oh, that's right. And, and so I do try to do some education there. Yeah. I, I don't know why people find those types of questions appropriate. I think because they're curious. And so sometimes I can feel, I sense if people are curious just for curiosity, or I can sense if they are genuinely interested in my family. My response is based on how I feel if that person is genuinely interested or if they're just curious. Right. Right. They're just, yeah, 100, 100%. I, I think I've been fortunate. We've We've never gotten that question because our girls are very, very close in age. And most people think they're twins because they look so much alike. So people usually don't have to ask us that question. And I'm usually not afraid to answer it. But I like Anna's point about you can tell when you're talking to someone what their intent is in some Mm -hmm. ways. And that does dictate the answers that you give them. Because another one is really about our kids' story. And I'd say that I haven't gotten the question in their later lives, their teenage years, but when they were younger, I did. Like people wanted to know what her story was. And we don't share our kids' stories, do we? No. No. Why don't we share their stories? Because it's their story. Yeah. Exactly. (laughs) It's their story to tell. In fact, when our daughters came, we started them in school pretty quickly after they got home. We had them home a few months, but some of the English teachers said they didn't speak any English. And we were told that the sooner we could get them in school and get them immersed, the better it would be for them. And we just wanted some structure for them. And they they both really loved school in Haiti and we knew they would love school here. And one th- interesting thing we had to try and navigate was our older daughter started in third grade. And by the fourth grade, she knew enough English that she was oversharing her story in class. Mm. And that was kind of a, that was where we had the conversation. It was kind of a reverse of what you're saying, Stacy, because we actually had the conversation with her mm-hmm. saying, this is your story. And what you say, you can't take back. So be mm-hmm. really careful what you tell in class and at school. If you feel comfortable, you can tell it, but be careful. So it kind of goes along to what you said, but that was something we had to try and navigate. That's good. I often use the example of like, you you don't want to explain your uncle as, you know, the alcoholic uncle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Everywhere he walks in, he walks in, everyone's like, oh, that's the alcoholic uncle. Well, that's, you know, <laughs> some yeah. information yeah. you have to tell. So when yeah. I'm telling people my kid's story, I don't want them to be known as the adopted kids who this is their story. That's, that's right. Not, I want them to be able to grow and have their own identity. And that's why we don't tell our kids story. Yeah, that's right. That's good. All right. Well, let's move on to just touch on trauma. We believe that all adopted kids, all families have trauma. So why do we say that? Jen, do you want to take a stab at that first? Stacy, we were talking earlier and you talked a little bit about the big T trauma and the small T trauma and how most of us can say we've been through small T trauma in our lives. We can think of incidences that have were traumatic for us, but our kids, kids from hard places have been through big T trauma. And this is trauma that starts in the womb and goes right up until they are removed and and feel more safe where they are. Our daughters had a unique situation in that they're from Haiti. And one of our daughters, I feel comfortable telling this, so that's why I'm going to tell it, was in, in her mother's womb when the earthquake hit Haiti. And I can't imagine how much trauma was going, adrenaline and all the things that were going through her mother's body Mm -hmm. that were getting into her as she was in the womb. And this is science. I mean, this has been proven. There's another really good book out there called The Body Keeps the Score that talks about things that happen in utero and throughout life. Your body keeps track of that in a physical manifestation. Our girls had extra trauma because they were removed 
from their first family when they went to the orphanage. And then when they got comfortable at the orphanage for a few years, they were removed from their friends there and brought to live with us. So they suffered loss numerous times in their life and brought to a country and a place where everything smelled different and the food was different and everybody looked different and the mm-hmm. weather was different. And I think it was so traumatic for them that if we even ask them about the first year that they were here, they have very few memories of the first year they were here. Hmm. Yeah. So Anna, what would you say around trauma? Because your little guy came home little. Well, I, months. Yeah. Right. So what do we believe around trauma when, when they're infants and adopted? Being separated from first mom is traumatic. Even in the very best adoption mm-hmm. situation, it still is mm-hmm. traumatic. Mm-hmm. The smells and the sounds and everything that the child would have known in utero is disrupted during adoption. If people go into adoption thinking that their child is a blank slate, <laughs> that that's just going to be a rude awakening. Because the child has come with already nine months of of experience. And, you know, our child, our son joined our family at four months. And so he'd already had four months of living before he joined our family. And then again, traveling across the world and Mm -hmm. all the different smells and, and sounds it is traumatic on a little, little body. When our daughter joined our family, that was also traumatic for him. And, and so that was another change that happened. Mm-hmm. Change is hard on little kids. And so mm-hmm. even with biological children, there is different points of trauma through their life as well. You know, and then if I think through the brain science of trauma, so then how it affects daily life, someone who's experienced trauma is extra sensitive to feeling unsafe and perceives that unsafe often as an attack. And so the person moves into fight or flight really fast in order to protect. Many, many children who were adopted have are hyper vigilant. They're just scanning all the time mm-hmm. to know what's safe and what's not safe. Yeah. So that's what we've seen through a lot of kids who were adopted. They just are always aware, always scanning and having that, that heightened sense just never lets their body calm. So that makes their, they could be sensory seeking then or sensory avoidant. They could have more difficulty in school. It could manifest as ADHD. There's multiple layers because they're hyper vigilant all the time. I like to say our older daughter is like Jason Bourne. You know, when we enter a room or a large social situation, I can watch her. I can watch her eyes. I can watch her scan for the exits. I can watch her scan where the food is. I can see her scanning every face to see if she's safe. She is extremely hypervigilant in crowded situations. And it is, I call it Jason Bourne because that's what it is. And at home, then that safety can translate to what I can't have a granola bar right now. And that's unsafe. And now there's an explosion because I need to self protect over something like that, or, you know, a sibling took a toy. And so what what I'm saying is this trauma, you know, then transfers into hypervigilance around safety, which then will trigger into fight or flight really fast, real fast, yes, real fast. (laughs) We all can raise our hands. We've experienced this, haven't we moms? Yeah. Right. So then when my pattern of parenting is to be maybe big, loud, large, that is not a good setup, is it? It's not. And what's interesting is even if I, I don't, even if I don't yell, but if I raise my voice, it sounds Mm -hmm. like yelling. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or even if I think that I'm giving a serious look, the look could come across as shaming or condemning. So everything is threatening, right? Everything is heightened. And I wasn't prepared for that. Right. No, I wasn't either. But that's how I was raised too. So this is how you do it. Isn't it how you do it? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Because it works or it worked. (laughs) It worked for me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I well, think right. you see, one thing that people ask me a lot is, is this harder than you thought it was going to be as far as navigating all this trauma? Mm-hmm. And I always tell them that it's, we were prepared for the trauma. We were not prepared for 
how much that trauma would permeate every part of our life for so long and how long it takes to work through that trauma. I mean, this really is a lifelong process for these kiddos. So those who have been around connected families and maybe are a little bit familiar with what we teach and around the framework, you heard me mention big, large, and loud. And those are kind of trigger words around the foundational layer of the framework, which is that we want to communicate the message you are safe with me. So it's the opposite of big, large, and loud. And so I think now maybe our listeners are starting to understand why we're here and we're going to be talking about the framework and why the three of us are sitting here so grateful for connected families and for the framework, because it gave us just some new perspective of how to parent our kids. And what I want to say right now, before we go to the break is that Jen mentioned it a little bit earlier. And the reason that we talked a little bit about trauma is because we do believe that sure. Our adopted kids have experienced trauma. We have all experienced trauma. Your kids have experienced trauma. I'm talking to all of you listeners out there. And so while, you know, being safe for us as, a, as parents of children that came to us by adoption, you know, is particularly important. It's important for all of us. And that's why we really believe this podcast is, is useful for everyone today in this topic. Okay. So after the break. Jen and Anna, we're going to dive into the framework and we're just going to go layer by layer, the four layers and talk about how it influences our parenting even today with our kids. You good? We're good. We're good. All right. See you after the break. Hey friends, would you like to be part of the Connected Families team? (laughs) Well, I want you to know that we have an exciting opportunity for you. It's called the Insiders Team. I have a question for you. And we are inviting you to be a part of it. Here's how it works. As part of the insiders team, you will receive an email each Friday with one, only one simple action step. They will take five minutes or less. And it comes from our executive director, Anna Brosh. You'll also have early access to resources that we are developing. You will be called on to give feedback. You're going to learn about jobs or opportunities that we have available first. And here's a good one. You're going to feel all the love of the Connected Family staff. You'll feel the love because we consider the Insiders team sort of like our jet engine. (laughs) When Anna, our executive director, set it all up, we had no idea how crucial this team would be to our continued continued growth and reach. Well, if you're interested in joining the Insiders team at Connected Families, check the links in our show notes to sign up or go to our website and search Insiders team. We look forward to having you on board. All right. Well, we're after the break and I'm having this wonderful conversation with my good friends, Anna and Jen, who also work with me here at Connected Families. You guys, we were talking about adoption and the things that make us bristle. We talked about trauma and we're going to dive into the framework now and just how each level has really transformed how we see parenting and how we show up with our kids. But I want to ask you guys how you came to connected families and really, you know, what was the moment or the season of life that made you realize the old way is not working. I need something new. Maybe Anna, do you want to start? Sure thing. Uh, my kids were around three and five, four and six in that general area. When I realized that the way that I had been parenting just wasn't effective. I had truly read all the books. I listened to all the podcasts. I was doing everything I could to be a successful parent. And, and I think One of the struggles I really had is that I, I thought that I knew what I was getting into. I didn't. And so I was going to do everything in my power to figure this out. And I was going to be a successful parent. So it was all about me. It was my energy. And really all that energy was making my children feel like they were a project and I was there to fix them. So they had this identity as being broken. When I saw the connected families framework, again, my kids were around three and five, four and six in that general age range. And 
the connected families framework put the, you are safe with me at the bottom. And then you are responsible at the top in my head, all my energy up to that point had been completely flipped and I didn't even know it. So there was this one day when my son was angry, I was angry. We were in the middle of a big fight and he threw a kitchen stool at me and it made this huge gash gouge in my kitchen floor. And I took him by the neck and I pushed him down to the floor to see what he had done to my floor. I wanted him to see the damage he had caused. And it was that moment that broke me because I realized that I was not safe. He had experienced trauma as an infant and transitioning to our family. And when my daughter came that transition, he had had all of this trauma. And then I was piling more trauma on top of that. I wasn't part of the healing process. I was part of the problem. So it was around that time that a friend introduced me to connected families. And one of the first things I saw on the website was the new rendering of the serenity prayer that is prominent on our website. God grant me the serenity to accept the people I cannot change, the courage to change the one I can and the wisdom to know it's me. And that moved me to a depth that I didn't even know that was possible. And I was, I was broken and I needed to get to that place before I could really, really transform my parenting. And so connected family just came into my life at the right time. Mm -hmm. Really good. And then you've learned the question, what's going on in me (laughs) is where we start. (laughs) Always. Daily. Yeah. Which is just so important because when we do have children who are quick to react, quick to feel like they need to protect themselves. So big reactions, it's so much more important for us to know what's going on inside of us so that we can come slow, low and listening instead of previously big, large and loud. And that's the deep foundational work that we have learned to do as we parent. Jen, do you have thoughts around this? You are safe with me message. So I knew Anna from school. Our kids knew each other. And she suggested that I take the discipline that connects in preparation for our adoption as part of our process and to let our agency know we were doing our education. And when we finished the course, I thought, oh my gosh, how did I not find this? This would have been great for our biological kids and still is, but I was seeing it all through the adoption lens. That's how I know that discipline that connects and connected families is not only good for adoptive families, but for families that have grown their families other ways. So you came to connected families just like, okay, I'm doing my studies to be <laughs> yep. able to adopt my kids. And then yep. you're like, wow, this but is it was, everyone. It was so eye opening and it was so eye opening and a reminder that with these kiddos, traditional parenting doesn't work. Really good. Okay. Let's move on to the next level of the framework. You are loved no matter what, which I had tears in my eyes thinking about that in the context of this adoption and all that our kids have, you know, gone through and man, what a powerful, powerful message that we want to communicate to our kids. Which one of you would like to start? talking about this level? I can start with that because our kiddos were a little bit older when we brought them home. I think there's so much that happens in your family with biological kids and meeting their needs when they're young, that they had never have any doubt that they're loved, but having to show empathy when you don't feel like showing empathy and asking yourself constantly, what's it like to be my child? Does my child know they're loved in this moment? Move toward the struggling child. These are all things that are so hard and yet so important and so rich. Yeah. I know empathy was something that I really had to grow in big time. (laughs) I had to learn how to understand what was going on inside of my child. I mean, I remember when she was little, specifically the question, is this an adoption issue? Is there underlying issues there? And I would think that, and it would just be so overwhelming to me. You know, I didn't even know what to do with it. But later through connected families, I learned to ask the question, like, what is going on inside of you right now? And this was a really, this was an area where I felt like, you know, this question, it doesn't even matter if my child has gone through big T trauma, little T trauma, you know, that is something that I want to grow in. And I want to work in is to understand what's happening inside of my child so that I can come alongside them as a teammate and supportive. And that's what you are loved no matter what really looks like at a very deep level. And so then I'm seeing through 
you know, reactive behavior, quick reactions mm-hmm. or defensive behavior, or, you know, any of those kinds of behaviors that might come because of trauma. Okay. Let's move on to the third level of the framework, which is you are called incapable. One of my favorite levels, but I'll let you take a stab at it first, Anna, go ahead. Yeah. You, you know, all children obviously are a gift from God. And it's amazing to see that gift just unwrapping each year when you watch your kids grow and develop and see their strengths. I don't know what it's like to raise biological children, but for me, it's kind of a, this amazing surprise when I see different traits come out in my kids, I see their tenacity or their focus or their love of play or, you know, whatever it is that I am watching unwrap as they grow older, as they mature, and then being able to pull that out and say, I wonder how God's going to use that someday. Mm-hmm. And just put that out there. And, and maybe in biological families, there's like, well, this is how our family always does this, mm-hmm. or this is what our family is good at. Our family and, is good at math yep, or basketball. Our, right. Mm-hmm. When you're raising children through adoption, you don't know. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just this mystery. It's this unwrapping of this beautiful gift that God's given us. And that for me is probably my favorite part of parenting, just imagining what the future is going to be like, imagining with them, pulling out their strengths, calling those out all the time as much as I can. I think it's just fun. That to me is fun. I will feel like I am a successful, air quote, successful parent sure. if I can encourage my kids in their gifts and then see them someday use their gifts to bless the world. Agreed. Here, here. I just love it. And I sometimes phrase that is in this way. We have learned to just honor our differences Mm -hmm. because we are a family. Well, I mean, actually we're intercultural and interracial family. My husband is from Scotland and so we're all different and we love honoring how God has created each one of us and then celebrating each other in that way. Well, let's move on to responsible. This is the top of the framework. And this is a good one because the message is you are responsible for your actions. (laughs) Exhale, (laughs) big exhale. So Jen, how does this message you are responsible? How does that play out? in your parenting right now? You know, I I was raised in a home where we didn't say sorry a whole lot in our house. I'm not, it was a really loving, really connected home, but it wasn't necessarily modeled for me. And so this part of the framework, I realized that I cannot possibly expect my kids to do things that I am unwilling to do. So I'm just going to tell a quick story. One day last week, I was calmly talking to my daughter about something that she disagreed with. And she started talking over me and my 11 year old daughter. And I banged my hands on the kitchen counter and said, listen, and I got big, large and loud. Mm -hmm. And she was far away from me in the kitchen. So she knew she was physically safe, but she got a look on her face and she turned around and walked out of the room. And I immediately thought, oh man, I messed up. She did not feel safe in that moment. So after I got myself together, I, about five minutes later, I walked into her room. She was sitting on the bed, reading a book. And I said, sweetheart, I said, I am really sorry. I banged my hands on the counter. I shouldn't have done that. One thing I've learned about apologies, and I'm sure it was through connected families and other places is as a parent, when you are willing to humble yourself and apologize, there cannot be a, but on your apology. You need to apologize and leave it at that. So I can't say, but you were talking over me. Mm -hmm. Or, but you were being disrespectful to try and excuse your behavior as a parent. So the next day she, and she accepted my apology and she forgave me. And the next day she came to me in the morning because the rest of that evening was terrible. She, She was really disrespectful and rude to me. And I think I just had set something off in her that was not good. And I stayed calm and we got her to bed and she knew she was safe and loved when she went to bed, but she was still being rude and disrespectful. And the next morning she came and found me immediately when she woke up and she said she was sorry for being so mean to me and asked for my forgiveness. Now, are those two things connected? Connected, I, I don't know, but I can't mm-hmm. help but think that if I had not modeled that for her and it was excruciating, I will tell you, apologizing as a parent is excruciating. I don't know if she would have done that. Mm-hmm. And it was mended. And we got to have a talk about how much better you feel when you make things right and how that icky feeling you feel inside will go away when you have made things right. 
or you've made things wrong. I love that story, Jen, because you know what? We often in the framework talk about you are responsible for your actions as we're telling our kids that we're, you know, our kids are responsible for their actions Mm -hmm. and you just flip that and said, no, I'm responsible for my actions and I'm responsible to reconcile to my kids when I am showing up in ways that are not honoring to them or myself. Yeah. Ooh, that's good. And that's powerful. Anna, I think you have something to say though, about what it does look like to think about this level in terms of our kids. My go-to phrase that permeates really all of my parenting is I'm not worried. I know you're going to figure this out. And I say that a lot. Mm-hmm. And I, I say that because I, I can wring my hands and I can be anxious. And, but I want my kids to know that they are going to make mistakes along the way. There are going to be some bruises, mostly figurative, some literal, <laughs> um, and they're, they're going to learn from those mistakes. We're not going to swoop in and fix the mistakes, but they're going to learn from them. So they know that if they do make a bad choice, there's an impact for that bad choice. But I don't want them to see me like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen in the future? I just right. want them to hear confidence. And so yeah. for me, my confident phrase is, I'm not worried. I, I know you're going to figure this out. And if you need my help along the way, I am here for you. I yeah. can help yeah. you. We can walk through this together. My faith really rests on the promise that God redeems all things. So even bad choices, God can redeem those. And, you know, just like Jen losing her temper in the kitchen, I have made plenty of bad choices in my early parenting and even still do. Mm -hmm. Um, So when I do make a bad choice, how can I redeem that? And, And again, being an example for my kids and really my hope and my prayer is that my kids can see that truth in me, that God does redeem all things. Uh, just recently I had a opportunity to ask my daughter, Hey, what can God redeem? And her answer is all things. So this is just something that we say. Oh, in our so good. And it does permeate my parenting. It permeates yeah. our family. It is a family value. God does redeem all things. Amen. I love that. So good, Anna. That's really good. Well, friends, I think we've painted a great picture here, you know, around adoption. We've talked about that. And then we've painted the picture around the framework and really how each level of the framework has influenced our perspective, has changed us as moms in how we come and we we parent our kids. So thank you, Jen and Anna, for being with me today. Well, hey, friends, if you found this podcast useful, I want to be sure you know that the conversation will continue every Monday over on the Clubhouse app. We have a live conversation where you can just listen in or you could raise your hand and ask a question. We would love you to join us over there. We put links in the show notes for all the things. And please go check out our new website. It's at connectedfamilies.org. I'll see you next time. 